So this guy, the guy I'm going to talk about in this podcast, wrote a book. Well, actually, he wrote several books about 30 years after the end of the American Civil War. 30 years, so not quite long enough for the wounds of that war to have healed. Uh, where he talks about the need for gentleness. That's right. Picture a uh, say a mom rubbing the back of a napping child, that kind of gentleness. He wrote in his book, this world needs nothing more than it needs gentleness. Now I find this fascinating because he wrote this after having lived through the war and 30 years later, He's talking about gentleness. Let's talk about James Miller, James Russell Miller, J.R. Miller, who I spoke about, uh, I think, about two podcasts ago when I talk about his uh, writings during the Civil War, what he thought the impact of, of the war was on Christianity. Uh, James R. Miller, I should say, because it, it is uh, around the Civil War time, I want to make, make it clear up front in the beginning of this podcast that he was once he was uh, totally against slavery he said in fact a couple of quotes from him when the bloodshed of war has ended the suffering will still go on until every trace of slavery shall be wiped out the suffering will go on he said god will settle the question in his own way but he also says human slavery is a clog to all kinds of progress in a state to the progress of Christianity, as well as the arts and sciences, wealth and internal improvements. When this barrier is removed, then educate, education and religion will be advanced and the social and moral darkness of slavery will be dispelled. So uh, this book that he writes about on gentleness really has nothing to do with the Civil War. Now, as some historians have noted, he would often use uh, references back to the Civil War that he remembered and use them as sermon illustrations. In fact, during the Civil War, he filled two notebooks with his Civil War impressions and experiences. And then later in the future, as I mentioned, he would turn to these notebooks and uh, use some of the things he wrote for illustrations. Uh, James R. Miller was a Christian and he served in the uh, group of about a, th a couple thousand who were volunteers, non-military, providing humanitarian aid. And in his particular case, since he would become a, a, a preacher, he would also spread the gospel. Like I said, the book is not about uh, the Civil War, but he does include uh, in the beginning of the book a quick story about how some of the uh, sort of nurses provided help to some of the uh, to both armies she says this the battle was over two mighty armies had met in terrific conflict and the earth had quivered beneath the shock great destinies had been decided after the battle gentle women came upon the field and went direct quietly and quickly among the wounded and dying with water and wine and food and words of cheer and kindness there was a divine power in the ministry of these angels of comfort who came after the battle when all was still than in the awful force of the battle itself they were strong only as they were gentle gentleness he says is the power of God working in the world now, the reason I want to focus on this today is because when you think of the word gentleness, like I said, if you think of uh, you think of something that you would maybe teach to preschool age children. In fact, you can find uh, books about uh, teaching kids to be kind and gentle. And uh, there are cute, colorful books that um, have maybe bears on the cover. I've seen a couple of those when I was at the bookstore recently. When you you know want to make sure that little preschool kids aren't kicking each other underneath the table and so forth, that is the kind of arena you would think is normal for a discussion about gentleness. And 
Uh, unless you were to wrap around the word the history of gentleness, um, you wouldn't really hear about this in an academic setting. Uh, it's a little bit too unsophisticated. Uh, nobody gets awards for being gentle. So that's actually one of the things that intrigued me about this book. And also given the fact that it was written by someone who had experienced the Civil War. And this is 30 years out. So you ask yourself, what is somebody thinking who has uh, seen the, the devastation of the Civil War? What is their mindset like after this? Um, somebody who was against slavery uh, and somebody who was... Um, uh, concerned about the implications of this to his fellow man and also asking questions about you know what does God think about all this and so here he is 30 years later writing sentences like this gentleness is a beautiful quality it is essential to all true character nobody admires ungentleness in men or women when a man is harsh, cold, unfeeling, unkind, rude, and rough in his manner, no one speaks of his fine spirit. When a woman is loud-voiced, dictatorial, given to speaking bitter words, and doing unkindly things, no person is ever heard saying of her, what a lovely disposition she has. She may have many excellent qualities and may do much good, but her ungentleness mars the beauty of her character now he he's talking about gentleness uh, for both men and women he says quote no man is truly great who is not gentle courage and strength and truth and justness and justice and righteousness are essential elements in a manly character but if all these be in a man and gentleness is lacking the life is sadly flawed. And then he goes and cites the Apostle Paul in the New Testament to back up his point. And he quotes Paul where Paul said in the New Testament, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, in other words, if I have all these great spiritual abilities, but have not gentleness, if I speak with tongues of men and of angels, Imagine that, being able to speak with the tongue of an angel, okay? Uh, but have not gentleness. I have become just a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and I know all mysteries and all knowledge and I have all faith so that as to remove mountains but have not gentleness, I am nothing. And if I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body to be burned, like as a sacrifice, but have not gentleness, it profits nothing. He says, if any Christian, even the most Christ-like Christian, would pray for anything new, some added grace of character, let it be for gentleness. This is the crown of all loveliness, the most Christ-like of all Christ-like qualities. And he says that this is uh, the source. This is interesting because he says that the source for this is God himself. The Bible gives us many a glimpse of the gentleness as an attribute of God. He talks about Mount Sinai where the law is given in sternness. We hear the voice of the thunderings and we see the flashing of lightning clouds and darkness and all terribleness surround the mountain the people are kept far away because of the awful holiness of the place no one thinks of hearing anything gentle at mount sinai yet scarcely even in the new testament is there a more wonderful unveiling of the love of the divine heart than we find among the words spoken on that smoking mountain quote and the lord passed by before them and proclaimed the lord the Lord, a God full of compassion and graciousness, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving inequity and transgression and sin. And so he gives other examples where you wouldn't expect to see gentleness on the surface, but he says if you dig deeper, you'll see it. But nonetheless, 
the world needs nothing more than it needs gentleness. We naturally crave gentleness. It is like a genial summer into our life. Beneath its warm, nourishing influence, beautiful things in us grow. Then there are always many people who have special need of tenderness. We cannot know what secret burdens many of those about us are carrying, what hidden griefs burn like fires in the hearts of those with whom we mingle in our common life. He says, not all grief shows itself on the outside. Many people just keep this inside and don't really discuss it. Remember how Jesus himself longed for expressions of love when he was passing through his deepest experiences of suffering and how bitterly he was disappointed when his friends failed him. He said, many a life goes down in the fierce, hard struggle for want of the blessing of strength which human tenderness would have bought. Many a man owes his victoriousness in sorrow or in temptation to the gentleness which came to him in some helpful form and from a thoughtful friend. Life is not easy to most people, he writes. Now he writes this, and it's not just the Civil War that he experienced. He also gets, uh, he lives through some other bad times, okay? He lived through a depression. And uh, so there's a lot that he has seen. And yet, uh, I remember there was a quote that says, uh, sometimes things happen in our lives that will either make us hard, uh, like just rough, or it will soften our hearts and make us compassionate towards others. So I think it's safe to say when you read uh, his writing here that he was the latter category where the experiences that he had in life, and particularly some of the most turbulent periods of uh, American history, uh, he was better off for it. Um, but he goes on to say, life is not easy to most people. Its duties are hard. Its burdens are heavy. Its strain never relaxes. There is no truce in its battle. This world is not friendly to noble living. So, isn't that true? If you are trying to live out like this, to try to be a gentle person, just think about how, how um, everything is against you, either when you're in traffic, when you're at the mall, especially at this time of year, when everybody's doing their shopping, and everybody's got that so so everybody's so happy to be out there aren't they they're just going out there and they're just uh, um, I mean I remember recently saying uh, seeing just in a parking lot how unhappy and, and honking of horns and impatient people were so it is uh, clearly not too hard to see that in fact this world is not friendly to noble living to trying to live a different way he says there are countless antagonisms and there's a reference again to a war. Imagine, picture a battle where you're going through all these lines of enemies. And that's what he describes life as. The end goal when you die. But you have to go through all of these uh, lines with strong enemies before you get to heaven. Human help is not always ready when it would be welcomed. Too often men find indifferences or opposition where they ought to find love. Life's rivalries and competitions are sharp and oftentimes deadly. And wouldn't he know that? He says, we can never go wrong showing gentleness. There is no day when it will be untimely. There is no place where it will not find welcome. It will harm no one. And it may save some from despair. The touch of a child on a woman's hand saved a life from self-destruction. He says, even in Jesus' time, the world was full of cruelty. The rich oppressed the poor. The strong crushed the weak. Women were slaves and men were tyrants. There was no hand of love reached out to help the sick, the lame, the blind, the old, the deformed, the insane, nor any to care for the widow, the orphan, the homeless. Then Jesus came and for three and thirty years he went about among men doing kindly things in reference to uh, Jesus' three and a half year ministry. He had a gentle heart and gentleness flowed out in his speech. 
He spoke words which throbbed with tenderness. There was never any uncertainty about the heartbeat in the words which fell from the lips of Jesus. They throbbed with sympathy and tenderness. The people knew always that Jesus was their friend. His life was full of rich helpfulness. No wrong or cruelty ever made him ungentle. He scattered kindness wherever he moved. Picture that, scattering kindness wherever he moved. Now certainly that's not describing me. I want to be clear here. I'm not uh, saying holier than thou type of thing. This is certainly the case in the New Testament of Jesus. But we all fall short when it comes to this. He writes regarding the crucifixion that even though Jesus were, was all these things, he was gentle and he healed and he was kind and he was tender and sympathetic. One day they nailed these gentle hands upon a cross. After that, the people missed him for he came no more to their homes. It was a sore loss to the poor and the sad and there must have been grief in many a household but while the personal ministry of jesus was ended by his death the influence of his life went on he had set the world a new example of love he had taught lessons of patience and meekness which no other teacher had ever given he had imparted new meaning to human affection he had made made love the law of his kingdom Again, we're talking about something written in 1896 to an audience that was both uh, uh, in the U.S. and abroad in London. He says, uh, he goes on to say that the influence of the death of Jesus also has wonderfully helped in teaching the great lesson of gentleness. It was love that died upon the cross. The influence of the death of Jesus on this world's life is immeasurable. The cross is like a great heart of love beating at the center of the world, sending its pulsings of tenderness into all lands. The life of Christ beats in the hearts of his followers, and all who love him have something of his gentleness. The love of Jesus kindles love in every believing heart. That is the lesson set for all of us in the New Testament. We are taught that we should love as Jesus loved, that we should be kind as he was kind, that his meekness, patience, thoughtfulness, selflessness should be reproduced in us. There is need for the lesson of gentleness in our homes. Their love's sweetest flowers should bloom. Then he brings it right to your doorstep. There in the home, we should always carry our purest and best affections. No matter how heavy the burdens of the day have been, when we gather home at nightfall, we should take only cheer and light. No one has any right to be ungentle in his own home. Now, you know, it's interesting. I want to pause right there briefly because I know now there's a trend of called gentle parenting. I didn't really realize that um, until I started doing research for this particular podcast. Gentle parenting. Now he talks about that as well, as particularly in the home, but I mean this is gentleness uh, long before gentle parenting uh, became uh, just one of the latest ways to, to do parenting. Uh, but he writes again, no one has any right to be ungentle in his own home. Imagine that. If he finds himself in such a mood, he should go to his room till he has vanished, till, till it has vanished, that mood. Um, and mother's life, he said, is not easy, however happy she may be. Her hours are long and her load of care is never laid down. And one day's tasks are finished and she seeks her pillow for rest. She knows that her eyes will open in the morning on another day, full as the one that is gone. Children are about her continually tugging at her dress, climbing up on her knee, bringing her, bringing their little hurts and their quarrels, their broken toys, their complaints, their thousand questions to her. And then with all the cares and toils that are hers and with all the interruptions and annoyances of the busy dates, no wonder if sometimes the strain is almost more than she can endure in quiet patience. Nevertheless, we should all try to learn the lesson of gentleness in our homes. It is the lesson that is needed to make the home happiness a little like heaven's. Home is meant to be a place to grow in. 
it is a school in which we should learn love in all its branches. Think about that. It is a school in which we should learn love in all its branches. It is not a place for selfishness or for self-indulgence. It should never be a place where a man can work off his ill humor after trying to keep polite and courteous all day outside. It is not a place for the opening of doors of heart and lips to let ugly tempers fly out like ill-omened birds and soar about at will. It is not a place where people can act as they feel, however unchristian their feelings may be, withdrawing the guards of self-control, relaxing all restraints, and letting their worst self have sway. Home is a school in which there are great lessons, life lessons, to be learned. It is a place of self-discipline. We learn to give up our own way, or if we do not, we never can become a true friend. The great business of a true Christian life is to learn to love. He says, it's well that we get this truth clearly before us, that life with all of its experience is just our chance of learning love. The lesson is set for us, thou shalt love. As I have loved you, Jesus said, you ought to love one another. Our one thing is to master this lesson. We are not in this world to get rich, to gain power, to become learned in the arts and sciences, to build up a great business, or to do large things in any line. We're not here to get along in our daily work, in our shops or schools or homes or our farms. We're not here primarily to comfort the sorrow, visit the sick, perform deeds of charity. All these things, any of these things, he says, may be among our duties and they may fill our hands but in all our occupations, the real business of life, that which we always strive to do, the work which must go on in all our experiences, if we grasp life's true meaning at all, is to learn to love and to grow loving in disposition and character. Now, if you've ever uh, watched uh, Leo Bascalia years ago, um, on, uh, he was on television and he'd go around talking about you know, love. He has a PhD. You know, that sort of makes it respectable that I'm there talking about love. You know, who needs a PhD to love? Mom, I had a fifth grade education. She was the biggest, most wondrous lover I've ever known. You could Google him if, if you want to watch those videos. They're pretty interesting. Leo Bascalia. But this, again, 1896. Listen. We may learn the fine arts of life, music, painting, sculpture, poetry, or master the noblest sciences. But if in all this we do not learn to love and become more gentle in spirit and act, we have missed the prize of living. We should be gentle above all to those we love the best, your inner circle. And yet those who are closest to us, we tend to be more uh, harsh towards than complete strangers. He says, we owe our family special tenderness. Those within our home belong to this sacred inner circle. And much is said about the importance of religion in the home. A home without religion is dreary and unblessed indeed. But we must make sure that our home religion is true and real. That it is the spirit of life and not merely in form. Have you lived in a home where it was just informed? There was no love? It was just talk? It must be love. Love wrought in thought, in word, in disposition, in act. It must show itself not only in patience, forbearance, and self-control, and in sweetness under provocation, but also in all gentle thoughtfulness and in little tender ways in all the family discussions. He said, "No amount of good religious training will ever make up for the will make up for the lack of affection in parents toward children. Doesn't matter how much Bible reading and prayer and catechism saying and godly teaching. He says there may be in a home if gentleness is lacking, that is lacking, which most of all the young need in the life of their home, a child." must have love. 
Sunch love is to life what sunshine is to plants and flowers. No young life can ever grow to its best in a home without gentleness. And he says, yet there are parents who forget this. And he gives examples on that. Now, the book is only 43 pages. Uh, you can find it online. I did. It's called A Gentle Heart, James R. Miller, A Gentle Heart, 1896. I'm reading off of the uh, PDF version. But he also ends with, uh, with the point that he just alludes to throughout his uh, brief uh, book here, which is that um, Christians can't drum this up on their own. This is something that is provided by God through God's Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity, and that enables Christians to act Christianly, to act Christ-like, and to actually show this love, which is a mark of true Christianity. He says, listen to these words again, 1896. We must never rest satisfied with any partial attainment of this gentleness. Just... <clears throat> Just so far as we are still ungentle, rude to anyone, even to a beggar, sharp in speech, haughty in bearing, unkind in any way to a human being, the lesson is yet imperfectly learned, and we must continue our diligence. We must get control of our temper and must master all our moods and feelings. We must train ourselves to check any faint rising of irritation, turning it instantly into an impulse of tenderness. We must school ourselves to be thoughtful, patient, charitable, and to desire always to do good. The way to acquire any grace of character is to compel thought, word, and deed, and act in one channel until the lovely quality has become a permanent part of our life. There is something else. We can never learn the lesson ourselves alone. To have gentleness in one's life must have to have gentleness in one's life one must have a gentle heart and this heart listen this, this is the source he says mere human gentleness is not enough we need more than training and self-discipline you can't work this up our heart must be made over before it will yield the life of perfect loving lovingness it is full of self and pride and hatred and envy and all undivine qualities. The gentleness that the New Testament holds up to us as the standard of Christian living is too high for any mere human attainment. And frankly, that's why it's so absent when you look around day to day. We need that God shall work in us to help us to produce the loveliness that is in the pattern. And this divine co-working is promised. Quote, the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. One of the results of having God's Holy Spirit as a Christian, he, he says, is fruit. That is characteristics, attributes of God in you. One of them being gentleness the holy spirit will help us to learn the lesson working in our heart and life the sweetness of love the gentleness of disposition the graciousness of manner which will please god when we toil and strive in the name of christ to learn our lesson of gentleness and yet grow disheartened and weary because we learn it so slowly be patient with yourself christ himself comes and puts on our canvas and touches the beauty and the touches of beauty which our own unskilled hands cannot produce. Let me say that again. When we toil and strive in the name of Christ to learn our lesson of gentleness and yet grow disheartened and weary because we learn it so slowly, Christ himself comes, puts on our canvas the touches of beauty which our own unskilled hands cannot produce. Again, this is from James Miller, who served in the United States Christian uh, United States Christian Commission during the Civil War, and he is writing about the need for gentleness to an American audience still doing what he was doing during the war, which is trying to spread the message of Christianity to an America that and has more 
more things in common with our time than it does with, say, 1815. The world is still very ungentle despite the teachings of Jesus Christ. Certainly very ungentle despite what James R. Miller tried to do. But hopefully you found this very interesting. Hopefully it will prod you to perhaps even look into this further on your own. And uh, in the meantime, don't forget to subscribe so that you can find out when the next podcast is available.